Welcome to chapter 16. Before we continue, I need to answer this important audience question. What is the difference between the episodes on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, and the episodes on the members private podcast and the chapters in the audiobooks? The member podcast and the audiobook chapters have just the chapter content, no intro, no middle break, no outro. It gets right into the action with Edward saying, last time on Everdark. The public podcast, which is what you're hearing now, usually has the same material, but broken up with this intro and the info break in the middle and my outro, where I usually tell you how you can support us or like and subscribe, that sort of thing. But some chapters have an even bigger difference, such as chapter 17 coming up next. These chapters have had parts taken out of them. Sometimes it's just a paragraph or two, but sometimes it has to be whole scenes or even quite frankly, most of the chapter altogether. We'll tell you more about why we had to do this during the info break in the middle. For now, on with the show. Last time on Everdark, sensing that Julian was about to feed from another vampire, Julian doing so out of desperation and the belief that Damon had abandoned him. Damon dramatically traveled from the Everdark to our world in the form of wolves. Now Balthazar has yet another guest, this one unwanted to deal with, and a bit of a broken heart. Everdark, Episode 16, Awkward Moments. You know, the next time I'm in trouble, I won't be calling you, Arceus, Balthazar said waspishly to the hulking berserker. In Christian's eyes, Arceus looked more like a cuddly bear at the moment, all sheepish and downcast eyes. Clearly, the confessor was embarrassed slightly by falling to his knees in shock at seeing Damon. Thinking of the hundreds of wolves breaking through the glass barrier, Christian had to admit that Damon was impressive. And other things. Sheepish yet calm, Arceus answered, You didn't call for me. I just came. And you were fine. He'd stopped choking you by the time I'd come in. My neck is bruised and my throat is sore, Balthazar pointed to his throat. Personally, Christian didn't see anything. It had been turning red and purple when Damon had just released Balthazar from his death grip, but now it was perfectly fine. He found it mildly amusing that this very tough vampire lord was acting like a drama queen. Listen to my voice, Balthazar cried. It's raspy from ill use by that... that... King? Arceus supplied helpfully. Balthazar, though, was having none of it. That... Bastard is responsible. The confessor shook his head and clucked softly. Careful, Balthazar, he might hear you and pin you to the wall again. He was made of wolves, not just one wolf, hundreds. He breached my bedroom like some kind of, of... King, Arceus offered again, even as he smiled indulgently at Balthazar. The confessor hadn't seemed a dour fellow before Damon arrived but there was almost this giddy happiness to him now. Balthazar gave him a black look. In return, Arceus said, Your bedroom wall is now quite repaired. No sign of the gateway to the Everdark at all. A gateway would have been useful, but no, it's just a wall again. Balthazar's hands rose up and down rather like the wings of a bird as it flapped on a line. And who can do that exactly? Just... Just create a new gateway between the two universes. Who? Don't say it. I know what you're going to say. A king? Not a king, Balthazar. The king. Our king. The confessor corrected mildly. And he's taken over my bedroom. Kicked me out of my own space and- Where else should our king stay but in the best bedroom in the house? Again, Arceus was mild as milk. While Julian and Arceus had carried an unconscious Damon to Balthazar's magnificent bed, Sophia had rushed out to bring in Maddie, the healer. Sophia had then surprisingly disappeared, even as Maddie froze in shock at seeing Damon. But then the healer came back to herself and burst into action. She immediately attached an IV line to Damon's arm and brought in half a dozen bags of blood to be dripped into his system. 
I've never worked on an immortal before, Maddie said nervously. Her gaze swept over the vampire king who lay magnificently in all his black leather and white fur on the middle of Balthazar's bed looking, well, looking like a king. But I believe he will be fine with blood and rest. He was too weak to leave Everdark. He came here for me. Idiot. Julian breathed the last. His best friend was sitting on the bed, holding one of the vampire king's hands in his. He was looking at Damon's peaceful face while biting his lower lip. The eyelids were closed, hiding those blood-red irises. He didn't want Balthazar to feed you, Christian said as he moved towards his best friend. Balthazar was with Arceus by the door. The vampire lord was still fingering his throat and staring at Damon with a mixture of shock and resentment. Yeah, that was the long and short of it. Guess he does want me as his fledgling. Or at least he doesn't want anyone else to have me. He's beautiful, Christian said quietly. He needed to know what his best friend felt towards this... this... alien being. Though Damon looked like a human, or rather a vampire, those eyes showed he wasn't. But there were other things about him, setting aside utterly the fact that he could become hundreds of wolves, that made Christian keenly aware that Damon was not like everyone else. He worried a little as he saw some of that difference in Julian, though he could not put his finger on what it was. He is, Julian answered. A pause then. And stubborn, and high-handed, and possessive, and— You're worried about him, Christian interrupted gently. Julian turned anguished eyes upon Christian. If I hadn't agreed to feed from Balthazar, he wouldn't have done this. He may have put himself at risk by coming here this soon, Christian. You didn't know, Julian. Christian laid a hand on Julian's arm comfortingly. He wasn't communicating. He was. I just couldn't hear him. He was frantic. Julian shook his head. If he's damaged because of this. I truly think he will be all right. Maddie said. She'd been quietly replacing an empty bag of blood with a fresh one. But nobody really knows, do they? He's one of a kind. Julian murmured. Christian thought about the white-hot hatred that had fueled his best friend for a decade against vampires. He shouldn't have been surprised that Julian would find it in his heart to care for one of them. It was easy to hate a group until one met individuals within that group that didn't match one's low expectations. He didn't show half as much concern for you when he sent you back to Earth on your own. Balthazar growled. His arms were crossed over his chest and he was glaring daggers at Damon. Arceus grasped his shoulder, his voice low. Balthazar, please, let this go. Julian was never yours to begin with. You must accept this. Balthazar shrugged off his hand and stormed out of the room with more muttered curses. The confessor took a deep breath. Christian, Balthazar needs you right now. Arceus gestured for Christian to go with him after the vampire lord. Christian was about to argue that Julian needed him more. Balthazar was acting out of pique, in his opinion, while Julian was really hurting. But his best friend cut off that argument. I'll be fine, Christian, Julian told him. Go on. Balthazar has been pretty banged up tonight. He was trying to do the right thing, and no one is thanking him for it. Still... Christian hesitated a moment. He wasn't keen to leave his best friend all alone with this strange vampire that didn't speak out loud, but only thought his mind to Julian alone. The conversation, while he'd pinned Balthazar to the wall, had been one-sided. They'd only been able to hear Julian's responses, none of what Damon said. And then there were those red eyes. They glowed like hellfire. When Christian had met the Vampire King's gaze for a moment, he'd seen something. A glimpse of eternity. If you're sure, I, I can come back immediately, Christian said. I'm good. I I'm just gonna sit with him for a while. Need to know he's okay. Julian answered. He'd reluctantly nodded and followed after Arceus. They had found Balthazar on the first floor, in a beautiful and airy living room. A fire crackled in the grate of a fireplace that bisected the large, arched room. The myriad of reds and golds and whites in the flames fascinated Christian with his enhanced vampiric sight. There were large, inviting sofas in white, dark blankets thrown over their backs that bracketed the area before the fireplace. 
Christian could already imagine curling down to read some historical treatise in order to prepare for one of his and Julian's shows. If we're allowed to do that any longer. He glanced over at Balthazar. The vampire lord was still going on about his grievances. Despite what Arceus had said, it didn't seem like Balthazar needed him at all. He was surprised that he was slightly miffed by it. He's not a guest. He barged in just when, when we were, when I was, Julian and Christian. The vampire lord seemed unable to complete that sentence, though. He strode angrily over to the roaring fireplace, resting one hand against the marble mantelpiece while staring into the flames. It's good he came when he did. Christian spoke for the first time since they'd left Balthazar's bedroom. I don't imagine he would have given Julian time to convince him not to kill you otherwise. I was doing what was best. Balthazar had been insisting on this since the whole strangling thing. Arceus and Christian's gazes met for a moment, and Christian felt he might have met a kindred spirit. The confessor clearly believed that Balthazar, for all his good and true reasons, wasn't being 100% honest with himself. He'd wanted Julian and Christian for himself. Any other reasoning he gave for why Julian needed to drink from him, while it might have been correct, was not the deep root reason for his desire. I dread to think of what he would have done if you had fed Julian. The whole house might have been forfeit, Arceus pointed out. He would have to be black-hearted and unworthy of our fealty if he did that. Balthazar looked coldly furious. Christian already knew that the Vampire Lord had a large problem with authority figures. Considering what his master was doing to him and the others, that was a good trait to have. But against Damon? Yeah, the king fainted, but once he's truly himself again, I fear what he'll be able to do. He is our king. He has certain expectations of us. Trying to take his fledgling probably rises to the level of traitor in his mind. Arceus explained incredibly calmly. He'd said as much half a dozen times already. He spared you when he could have killed you without a thought. Julian's the only reason you're alive, Christian pointed out. I know. He's a dear boy, a very dear boy. That makes sense, as he is your best friend. But Julian was, is, starving, Balthazar muttered. It's not like Damon can feed him yet. He tried to drink the bag blood before. Maybe he'll try again. I'm actually pretty sure he will, considering how worried he is about Damon, Christian said. Balthazar merely nodded. Christian could see he was still disappointed at not having best friends in his house. Christian was trying not to think about what this meant for him and Julian. He knew that Julian would not allow them to be parted. Neither would he. Balthazar and Damon would have to learn to get along. Or we'll dump both of them and go our own way. His stomach twinged. He was starving, and as if Balthazar felt it too, the vampire lord swung around to face him. His brows bunched together and his mouth flattened as he took in Christian. You are hungry, and here I am, your master being incredibly thoughtless. Balthazar approached him and touched his biceps with both hands, holding him lightly. Christian tensed, but forced himself to relax. He knew, though, that Balthazar had noticed and there was the faintest lines of disappointment on his forehead. It's not you, Christian blurted out, then gritted his teeth. He owed this man no real explanation for his reaction. Was it normal to be fine with strangers touching you? Shouldn't it be especially okay for good-looking ones like Balthazar to do it? Even more, especially ones who had saved you and your best friend's lives? So Christian added, I just am not good with people touching me that I don't know very well. But you seem like a toucher. Balthazar cocked his head to the side and gave Christian a fond smile. He squeezed his arms once and released them. I am, but I don't want to breach your boundaries. You already have, Christian admitted. But then when he saw the crestfallen look on Balthazar's face, he quickly added, But it's fine. I mean, it will be fine. Once I get to know you. Considering we are bound together forever. We'll take it slow, Balthazar offered as he brightened. This was the first time he'd looked happy since Damon had arrived. Okay, maybe you can start by telling me about yourself. Christian knew nothing of the Vampire Lord. Balthazar brightened. 
Excellent, because I love talking about myself. Hey guys, let's talk about why some of the episodes of the public podcast of Everdark have had content removed. It's because Everdark is a gay romance story and certain chapters have sensual scenes in them like most romances. These sensual scenes are not allowed on most third-party platforms, especially YouTube and iTunes. So that everyone can enjoy the story, we've had to fade to black during some parts. We just aren't willing to risk having episodes deleted like they have been in the past or our account deactivated by pushing the boundaries with them. YouTube and iTunes and Spotify will always win these sorts of fights against individual creators. These giant companies don't care about fairness and they don't care about discrimination. Not in the way you think. They may publicly say a lot of things, but privately they act stuff all the time. Those arguments that we would make about keeping this stuff up wouldn't even get past their tech support bots. They just give us the ax, say, you violated the TOS and move on, leaving us screaming into the void and leaving this podcast either deleted entirely or unfinished for the public because we lost the ability to upload. So that's why we've had to cut the sensual romantic scenes from the public podcast. You'll know when a public podcast episode is edited. It'll be in the title and the narration will literally fade out to a special message. But all is not lost because we're not dependent on YouTube, iTunes, or Spotify like so many other content creators are. We have still produced the full, unedited, fully sensual, episodes of Everdark, and they are available, just not in the public podcast. I'll tell you how you can get them at the end of this chapter. Asya smiled. At least he's honest. Balthazar scowled at the confessor, but it quickly became a lopsided grin. I am honest about that. Why do you not take him to the guest house? Asya offered. You need to feed to recover from your grievous wounds before you then feed Christian. And I'm sure that Christian would benefit in understanding how this part of the house works. I'm sure that Damon will need some humans to volunteer to feed him once he wakes, Balthazar said, his mouth flattening despite his obvious intention to play a good host. He is our king, Balthazar, Arceus said quietly. I will have another room prepared for you for right now until he can be moved. Thank you, old friend. I do appreciate all you do, even when you fall down on the job. Arceus just shook his head. You'll never let me live that down, will you? Never, Balthazar replied cheerily. Arceus grunted in amusement. Christian found himself grinning. He liked the way they were together. It seemed almost human. Also, let me know when His Highness awakens. Balthazar requested. I know you're not keen on Damon, but I believe you should rethink that, Christian said. And why is that? One of Balthazar's eyebrows lifted. Don't tell me that you're a royal worshipper too. God, no. Christian almost violently shook his head. I can't think of a stupider way of governing than by bloodline. See, Arceus? Christian has a good head on his shoulders. He is logical and scientific in his thinking. Balthazar crowed at the confessor. But since that is your way of government, Christian broke in, which had Arceus grinning back at the vampire lord. You should realize the benefits of an alliance. Right now, he doesn't know anything of what the modern vampire world is like. You can be a bridge for him. And I'm betting that if Damon allies with House Ravenscroft, then you won't be considered exiles for much longer. We, Christian, you're a member of House Ravenscroft too, Balthazar reminded him. But you're assuming that after he wakes, that he won't seek out better allies. Well, he might seek out additional allies, but he won't abandon us. Christian said with certainty. Because of Julian? Arceus guessed. I don't know if you two realized it, but Damon listened to Julian and did what Julian asked when Damon spared your life, Balthazar. He didn't just stop on his own. He did what Julian requested of him. Christian reminded them. Julian won't want to be parted from me. And since, as you said, I am a part of House Ravenscroft... He'll stick with us too. Balthazar tapped his chin and looked thoughtful. Exactly. I know you thought that Damon would simply take Julian away, but just a few minutes with those two 
tells me that Julian has far more power than Damon in that relationship. Christian couldn't help grinning at the thought. He wasn't surprised by this fact. Julian often played white knight and protector to his partners. Not that there had been really any serious ones. Julian had simply always been the one in charge. While Damon might be a king and used to commanding all the vampires, Julian would never simply follow his directions unless he agreed with them. His best friend was fiercely independent. Arceus squeezed his large hands together. Then everything we do to keep Damon safe and comfortable will enhance that friendship between our house and our king. Balthazar grunted. Maybe so. I admit it was a surprise to see Julian stepping between him and me. The boy had no fear. Julian is brave. Utterly brave, down to his bones. Christian assured them. Balthazar let a large, devilish grin cross his features. Then we need to see to the king's comfort. Come, Christian, let me show you the guest house. Balthazar took Christian down a parquet-floored hallway. It was broad and gracious with a high ceiling. There were oil portraits on the walls. Some were still lifes of fruit or flowers. Others were landscapes of waving wheat fields or ponds with a profusion of flowers peeking up from the water's surface. There were portraits, expertly done, of people long dead who stared out at Christian through intelligent eyes. He wondered if any of them were Balthazar's ancestors or perhaps family to others in his house. Speaking of others, he'd met only Ridley, Arceus, and Maddie of House Ravenscroft. Elena had just been a still figure on a bed. But now, as they passed by gracious rooms, he saw other vampires inside. There was a young man, really no more than a boy, with hair so pale it was almost white. He was laughing and talking amiably to a man that looked to be in his sixties, grizzled and dried out like a piece of old leather left in the sun too long. Both of them were sipping something red out of highball glasses. Christian's nose searched out the coppery smell of blood and he knew what it was. They stopped talking and turned their heads to look at him and Balthazar pass. They stared at him with open curiosity. The boy lifted his glass to Christian. Christian nodded his head, but then quickly looked away. Balthazar gently bumped his shoulder. You are an object of fascination and deep curiosity. We haven't made many fledglings since being exiled. And of course, they know who you are. Who I am? Christian blinked in confusion. Your show? They've watched your show. Christian hadn't considered that real vampires would be watching them. He wondered now how many of the views they got were from the Lords of the Night. It was a disturbing thought. Did they know you wanted to turn Julian and me? He asked. I never publicized it, but I imagine some knew. Balthazar admitted with a shrug. You say that so... so casually. But you're talking about the end of Julian and my lives. Christian crossed his arms over his chest. End of your first lives. But trust me, though it does not seem it yet, your second life is much better. Christian cast a glance at the vampire lord and saw that he actually meant what he said. Well, I admit that it is rather fascinating. Just then they passed another salon. Inside was a single... Tall, slender woman with black hair piled atop her patrician head. She wore a black dress and a simple choker of pearls around her swan-like throat. She, too, stared openly at him out of those strange silver eyes, but then inclined her head graciously when Balthazar greeted her. Who is she? Christian asked once they had passed by the door. That is Isabel. She once owned a great salon in Paris. She was dying of consumption when Oscar offered her the gift of eternal life, Balthazar murmured. How old is she then? And is Oscar here too? Christian asked. She's 263 years old. And yes, Oscar is still with us. Just as an FYI, you never ask how old a vampire is, Balthazar cautioned him. Why not? I understand why humans have an issue with age, but vampires? You don't grow any older, so how can it be an issue of vanity? Christian frowned at what he thought some odd carryover from human life. You've actually got it reversed. For a vampire, the older you are, the better you are, Balthazar explained. As we age, we get stronger. Our powers increase. 
Thinking back on Balthazar's power to control a whole room of vampires and the fact that he was head of his own house, Christian guessed he must be very old. How old are you? The vampire lord gave him a narrow-eyed look before breaking into laughter. Did I not just tell you that asking for a vampire's age is a no-no? Yeah, but you're very powerful and the boss here, so you have to be ancient. Christian guessed. Balthazar looked unutterably pleased. You would think so. But no, I'm an early bloomer. Christian's brow furrowed. Why is that? Balthazar shrugged. No one knows. There are rumors out there that I'm Iros reborn. I think that's nonsense, but I do encourage them as they keep other vampires wary of me and my people. Wh who is Iros? Christian asked. Balthazar opened his mouth in surprise, but then nodded as he realized that Christian knew little to nothing. Iros is the immortal who founded our bloodline. He was similar to Daemon, but could create fledglings, obviously. And in case you're wondering, he too is dead. Obviously, if I am him reborn, can't be in two places at once. Our unique gift is that of mind control. Mind control? Fascinating, Christian said and meant it. When will I be able to use that gift? It will develop with time. I would assume you will get the basic ability to lure humans to you, for instance, after you've fed from me a few times, Balthazar told him. Balthazar proceeded to tell him about the eleven bloodlines, the houses, and the relationship of Everdark to Earth in global terms. They had reached a pair of French doors that led outside by the time he'd explained that it was believed the time simply stopped in Everdark. It was never light there. The moons didn't move. No watches or clocks ever worked. And electronics were faulty at the best of times. But there was technology in the Everdark that was so far beyond what they had on Earth that they simply considered it magic. Christian was pleased that Balthazar didn't try to tell him it was real magic just technology that, though they could use it, they didn't really understand fully, though some of the oldest vampires had made some breakthroughs. Do you have any? Can I see some? Study it? Christian had asked. We do not bring it here, and unfortunately, as an exiled house, we have no access to the Everdark any longer, Balthazar explained. Well, we will now, with Damon, Christian said, more thinking out loud than meaning to say it. You are very certain Damon will be so generous with us. Balthazar's eyebrows were practically up in his hairline. You don't know how persuasive Julian can be. And stubborn. Very stubborn. Christian shrugged. Balthazar grinned. Well, I'm happy to have him working on our behalf, then. Christian was tempted to say that this was perhaps better than if Julian had joined House Ravenscroft himself. But that would have poked at a still fresh wound for Balthazar and he wasn't sure how he felt about it himself. He didn't want anything to separate him and Julian. He was certain that neither of them would allow this to, but it just made more obstacles for them. Balthazar led him down a few steps to a grey stone path that meandered through flower beds to a large house in its own right about one hundred feet away. The large blooms bobbed in the night air. Their scent was intoxicating. Christian forgot to ask more questions as he bent down to sniff one of the large flowers. He stared at it in the darkness. His vision was incredibly keen. He could see even its pollen, but the color was not the same as it would have been under bright sunlight. Christian felt a stab of pain. Christian, what is it? One of Balthazar's hands was on his shoulders. It was a light touch, barely there, not meant to upset him, but to comfort. I just realized that I'll never see the sun again. It was a stark statement. It held such grief in it. He just now realized one thing he had lost, and there was more behind it. Like an avalanche of parts of his life that were now gone from him, and he hadn't realized until this moment, Balthazar drew in a breath. No, you will not. It is the price we pay for the other things we gain by becoming lords of the night. One of those avalanche pieces unfolded before him. His parents' faces flashed before his mind's eye. How do I explain this to my parents? He asked. His parents were brilliant professors. 
They were quiet, studious people with incisive minds. They would figure out that something was wrong with him. They would, in their way, interrogate him until he broke down. He didn't lie to them. It was simply not something he did. How do I tell them about this? There was a pause before Balthazar spoke, low and quiet, his hand still a surprising, comforting presence on Christian's shoulder. Normally, we break from our families. Christian stiffened. That was not happening. But not always, Balthazar continued. Some families, when they learn about the existence of vampires, choose to join us as acolytes. Those are human helpers that are linked to the day. Some of those become vampires in the end. Others, others live out normal lives and have normal deaths. He tried to imagine his scholarly parents as vampires and couldn't do it. He assumed that not everyone was made into vampires who wanted to be. They were chosen. Could he turn his own parents if they wanted to be chosen? His head spun with it. He clamped down on his thoughts. Thinking of his family wasn't grounding him. He would have to pass all his feelings out later. What about the show? The business that Julian and I have? Will we still be allowed to do that? Christian asked. Of course. You can even still, well, pretend to look for vampires. Balthazar let out a slightly breathy laugh. People look younger for longer now. No one will question your youthful looks for at least a decade, if not longer. We'll have to eventually arrange for you to phase out of that part of your lives. Right. Of course, it makes sense. Christian stood up. He dusted his hands on the fronts of his pants. There's a lot to think about. There is. Balthazar agreed. But you have time, Christian. It'll all work out. The vampire lord then reached out and brushed his fingertips across the tip of Christian's nose. Christian frowned. I thought we were going to take the touching thing slow, he said. Balthazar smirked. You had pollen on your nose, but I won't save you from silliness again. No, no, thanks. Pollen removal is allowable at any time. Christian scrubbed his nose with his right hand. The truth was that he was missing Balthazar's hand on his shoulder and was cursing himself for it. Good to know. They resumed walking again to the guest house. There were lights on in every window, though the shades were drawn, and all Christian could see were occasional silhouettes. Some of our human acolytes live on the premises for a time and offer to feed us, Balthazar explained as he gestured towards the house. We often don't allow any one of them to stay more than three months. Christian frowned. He was relieved that the vampires weren't killing them. Why not? Being fed from can become quite addictive, especially from an iros. Why do I have a feeling that every bloodline says that? Balthazar flashed him a smile, his white teeth practically glowing in the moonlight. But we are actually right. Because of the mind control thing? I would touch your nose again as I said, bingo. But there's no pollen there any longer. And yes, you are correct. Not only is the feeding physically pleasurable, but we also implant thoughts to make it more so. But that's... Mind control? Yes, Christian, it's what we do. As a proud member of the Iros bloodline, you will learn to do it too. Balthazar flashed him another unapologetic grin. It doesn't hurt them, just makes things better. Do you tell them you're doing it? Sometimes. Most no. Balthazar shrugged. I don't know how I feel about that. It's one thing if the person consents to it, but another if they don't. Christian hunched his shoulders. I assure you that every person wishes to be here of their own free will, Balthazar told him. They were at the front door now. It was painted a deep brick red and had a highly polished brass knocker and handle. Balthazar didn't use the handle. Instead, he simply opened the door and pushed it inwards, gesturing for Christian to precede him. Christian stepped inside to a large foyer. Flowers, likely from the garden, filled delicate oriental-style vases and gave the room a sweet scent. The walls were painted a deep royal blue. The floor was marble with an inset design of a compass. There were more oil paintings here with dark frames showing nautical scenes. The light came from a chandelier that was set on low and large pillar candles on various tables. 
It gave the place a pleasant, mellow appeal. Christian actually found himself relaxing. That was until he saw a woman, dressed in flowing white pants and a white wrap shirt, coming towards them out of a hallway that stretched deeper into the house. She had honey-blonde hair that hung loose on her shoulders, a mouth that was slightly too wide to make her classically pretty, a smattering of freckles over a pert nose and two bright green eyes. Even if he hadn't seen the green eyes, Christian would have known she was human and not a vampire. Every vampire, including himself he imagined now, moved in a certain graceful, almost liquid-boned way that humans simply couldn't replicate. Her face was slightly familiar to him. It didn't click that he knew her until she spoke. Welcome, masters, she intoned. Her voice was smooth and low, but then she saw Christian, and she gaped for a half a moment before sputtering out, Christian? Christian, is that you? It's me, Laura, Laura Shelty. We went to high school together, and I've watched your show with Julian, like, forever. What are you doing here? Are you an acolyte as well? But then she really looked at him, and one of her hands fluttered up to her mouth. You're... you're a member of House Ravenscroft? Oh my god! She quickly dropped down to her knees, forehead brushing the floor. Christian stared at her in open-mouthed shock. In that sudden silence, Balthazar murmured, And this is why we usually don't turn people in the same city as they were living before. Awkward moments. Seeing Laura on her knees, Christian had to agree with him. How many more of these awkward moments would there be? He was betting a lot more. If you want the full, unedited episodes of Everdark, there are two ways to get them. The first way, you can actually buy the audiobooks from us. They are divided into 15 chapter volumes each, that's about eight hours per volume, and they're available in our shop. Audiobooks are uncut chapters. When you buy them, they're just MP3s. You can download them to your devices and play them anytime you own them. The second way is to join my site, wraithrain.com, as a member. Members get a private podcast feed with the uncut chapters. They are the same tracks as what you get on the audiobook, but you can just stream them right from a private page after you log into wraithrain.com. The best part about being a member of Wraith Rain, depending on when you join, you could get access to multiple volumes. It's just $9.95 a month at the most expensive. So why not sign up for a little while, support us, and get access, not just to the podcast, but all the gay romance, written stories, and manga. Links to both the audiobooks and sign-up form are in the notes. Thank you guys so much for listening. The Everdark Podcast by X Aratare is performed by Edward Fox, Adam Riley, Jay Thelis, Bruno Devant, Kelly Michaels, and Hannah Hart, and Liz Gentle as Seer, edited by Matthew Prince, continuity by Adriel Wiggins. Everdark is produced by Wraith Rain Publishing in association with Her Grace Reads Studios. Copyright 2022 by Wraith Rain Publishing.